Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining the 11th webinar in our Pandemics and Society series. Today's event is From Outbreak to Endurance, a four-year journey through the COVID-19 pandemic and towards sustainable health security. Today, we will be discussing the landscape of pandemic preparedness at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, the work that's been done to bolster response sense, and what needs to be done before the next pandemic. I'll now pass it to our moderator today, Dr. Jennifer Nuzzo, who is a professor of epidemiology and the director of the Pandemic Center at the Brown University School of Public Health to get things started. Thank you. Hello, all, and welcome to our discussion. So we've recently passed what many consider to be the four-year anniversary of the COVID-19 pandemic. A lot has happened in these last four years. We, of course, know that more than 7 million deaths have been officially reported across the world, and we also know that this number is likely a vast undercount of COVID's true tolls. Um, more than a million of these deaths occurred here in the United States. Countries around the world have experienced historic declines in life expectancy. A generation of children had their education and social development disrupted and are struggling to catch up. There have also been important political and economic tolls that we are still unpacking. There have also been some positive developments. Uh, new tools like vaccines, therapeutics, and tests, an enhanced understanding of the threats that infectious disease pose, and also what we can do as societies to prepare, prepare for them. So what we'd like to do today is to reflect a bit on what has happened over the last four years, take stock of where we were, what the challenges were, but most importantly, we'd like to look ahead to think, talk about some of the things that we need to do to make sure that we never again experience a situation in which a pathogen upends our lives and our livelihoods, uh, talk about what still needs to be done um, and what we've learned along the way. So to have this conversation, I'm joined by my three brilliant Pandemic Center colleagues. Um, we have with us Dr. Seth Berkeley, who is Senior Advisor to the Pandemic Center. Um, many of you know the role that um, Seth played as uh, head of Gavi and um, the Vaccine Alliance, uh, which ha really has had a, a remarkable uh, track record in terms of millions of um, lives saved due to um, in advancements in vaccines, uh, vaccine allocation. We also have with us Dr. Beth Cameron, who's professor of the practice and senior advisor to the Pandemic Center. Uh, Beth is uh, expert in many things and has a long history uh, working in government, uh, the White House, Department of State and Defense, uh, has um, really uh, been uh, an architect of thinking about global health security and biodefense, uh, and he'll have a lot to share with us. And uh, Dr. Craig Spencer, who is an associate professor of the practice of health services, policy and practice. Um, Craig is also an affiliate of our Pandemic Center. Uh, he's an emergency medicine physician and has dedicated his career to improving uh, general health outcomes and inf fighting infectious diseases, both here and abroad in, in a, a variety of settings and has a lot to share with us as well. So um, with that, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, you have a lot of things to weigh in here about. Um, so maybe I'll just get started and uh, ask you all to just kind of go back to kind of when it all began. Say uh, end of 2019, early 2020, all of you were working in the health security field in some capacity. And just kind of like remind us, where were we as a world in terms of pandemic preparedness then? Uh, where do you think we were? Like, what did we get right at that point? Um, but where do you think the big gaps were at that point? So um, I'll let whoever wants to chime in first, please do. Well, I suppose, I mean, I can start. And and um, what was interesting is, you know, at first we didn't really know or understand what was happening. And I think this is when we talk about pandemics, I think that's the normal is that initial situation. Is it real? Is it person to person transmission? Are we getting all of the information? And, you know, as we began to understand that over the first few weeks and began to see that, yes, this could spread person to person, and it's something we had to worry about. Of course, one of the things we were thinking about is what are the interventions we could do? And, and I think one of the things to, to emphasize is prior to this moment in time, a vaccine, of course, is the most important tool you have to prevent viral infectious diseases. 
but it had taken the fastest they had ever been done at that point was four years. And most took 10 years with a high failure rate, et cetera. So as people were beginning to think about this is, oh, my God, we have this new disease panic as it starts to spread around the world. And a view that, yes, vaccines are important, but it's going to take us that, you know, very, very long period of time. So one of the good things that happened was the 327 days of the first vaccine being produced from the time the genomic sequence was there until it was given outside of a clinical trial. And I don't think anybody could have predicted that. Now, of course, we're trying to do better today with a 100-day plan to do that. But you know, the other side of that was people were very nervous and we didn't have the best communication tools to get the information out. And people said, oh my God, it happened too quickly. And, and um, you know, so there was a lot of challenges in the way this was done. And lastly, of course, we expected that there would be challenges in making these products available for the world. And it turned out that's exactly what happened. And we saw some of the worst things, which were you know, export bans and, and vaccine nationalism um, um, that went in place. So I think one of the things we have to think about is, have we learned from that? And I know we'll get into that here. We're in the midst of discussing the pandemic accord. So I think some of those are the reflections I have now. One last point would be um, what was really um, exciting was all of the research that went into vaccines. And now we're having a renaissance in vaccine technology. But of course, given also the vaccine hesitancy that exists, you know, how is that going to be taken forward? Yeah, so some upsides and downsides there for sure. Beth? Yeah, so I, I would definitely agree with Seth that one of the things that we got right um, in, in looking nationally in the United States is we did have an emphasis on vaccine technology. We had a, have had a historic emphasis on research and development and our departments of health and human services, our department of energy, our investments in DOD, our investments in Gavi and other um, actors, the Global Fund and CEPI that played major roles in the pandemic response, as well as the WHO. Um, we had capacity. We had some capacity. I think where we had a lot of challenges was scaling that capacity. I think we'll talk a little bit about that later. Speed and scale are a frequent refrain. And one of our colleagues, Jeremy Kaneindek, I think, named a report that he put out about the Ebola response, which we were discussing in 2019 as this pandemic was hitting us, focused on speed and scale as two of the major challenges we had. One of the things I think that we got right was a focus on preparedness and country capacity. And in 2019, I actually remember in January of 2019, I was sitting around a table in a meeting with a number of, of experts who are now serving all over the world and in government, including John Kengasong, who is now the State Department Coordinator um, for Health Security, as well as the PEPFAR Coordinator, talking about the global health um, security agenda and the need for a pandemic, what has ultimately become a pandemic fund. And it was a pipe dream at that point. There was not a lot of emphasis on it. And the pandemic catapulted the world into a more sustainable and measurable approach to pandemic preparedness. But I think where we still have a long way to go, and Seth highlighted this, is in developing facilities that allow us to actually respond more effectively. So some of the things that Gavi really pioneered, like COVAX, to get vaccines to countries more quickly, to get them in line, um, we made some progress, but we really have a long way to go, um, especially for commodities like personal protective equipment, oxygen, treatments, therapeutics. Um, and we still have a long way to go on vaccines, but we have made some really great and historic investments. I guess the last thing I'd say, maybe looking nationally, and this I think applies internationally as well, is we don't have yet the tools for different types of communities to be able to respond effectively. We had really binary measures. We had to open or close. We had to um, we had to you know scale. We had to try to scale tests quickly, but we didn't have a nuanced approach so that um, our states, uh, local officials, were actually able to adapt a response to an urban, a rural, or a tribal context. And I'll save my comments on testing for later, but I think that's one other place where we we really weren't able to speed or scale, and we need to do a lot better in the future. Right. Um, thanks for that. I just want to start by saying how much of a treat it is to everyone that's listening, um, because 
despite how bad the last four years have been, and they've been really bad in many respects, um, they could have been so much worse for a lot of people all around the world if it wasn't for the people that you're hearing from today. Um, Seth, your role at Gavi over the past decade, Beth, everything that you've done setting up an NSC, you know, by a directorate uh, multiple times and everything at the White House and everything you've done, Jen, to bring us all together, but also, you know, do congressional testimony in the early days and then, you know, do endless interviews with the New York Times and the Washington Post and anyone else that was asking over the past four years is, I think, a huge part of the reason that even if this was bad, um, it could have been much worse. So thank you all for all that you've done. Um, thinking about where we were prior to COVID, I go back a few years before when we were scrambling all around the world for PPE and trying to get money and worried about healthcare safety. With my own experience in 2014, working in West Africa, um, in Guinea, and I had seen at that time, as many of us may recall, that the global response was late, um, was insufficient, and asked for a lot more. And in the aftermath of that outbreak, we saw a lot of work put in place, money and commitments to how we're going to respond better to Ebola outbreaks and other epidemic threats in the future. And I was quite heartened because it seemed that we had learned some of those lessons. But there I find myself in November 2019 um, at the five-year anniversary of my own treatment for Ebola at Bellevue Hospital. And we were all convened kind of for a celebration, but really the celebration was more to ask for more funding because funding for things like Ebola was going to sunset in 2020 for this epidemic preparedness. And so there we stood, me and Ron Klain, standing in front of a bunch of folks trying to say why it was so important that we needed to continue to do this stuff. And you could see that there had been that panic, that neglect. I had worked for years at Columbia doing the Ebola, the PPE donning and doffing training. In 2015, a lot of people showed up. In 2016, fewer. In 2017, fewer. In 2018 and 2019, I couldn't get anybody to do this training because that threat had dissipated. And so when I think about what we got right before COVID, we knew we needed to be prepared because we saw what happened when we weren't. We knew the value of ongoing preparedness from our mistakes in Ebola. We knew that folks like yourself doing disease X and GHSI and biosecurity directorates and running gaming, like you knew that there was going to be some problems, but that we had the ideas and hopefully the people in place. That's good. The gaps that I saw is going back to West Africa. We saw even at this, at this moment in 2014, amplified in 2020, 2021, the lack of global solidarity and the closing up, the building of gates, the building of walls. In 2014, very, very, very few of our best medical and public health establishments in the United States did anything close to enough to respond in West Africa. And it was a shame then and embarrassing, I think, for some of the best institutions in the world to have done so little. But it also shot us in the foot because in 2020, no one Basically, no one in any of the hospitals throughout the U.S. had any idea about how to wear their own PPE, how to wear an N95, how to set up buddy systems for PPE, how to set up a unidirectional flow model in a hospital, how to respond and, pre and prepare for the fact that 30% of your staff is going to be out in one week, two weeks. Um, these are things that everyone had to learn on the fly that anyone who had worked for two days in an Ebola treatment center in West Africa would have known um, just you know quite easily. So... You know, in, it was just a few months before that meeting in 2019 that a friend of mine had come to me. She was working for one of the recently announced presidential campaigns, and she was talking about all these things that were really important that this you know, candidate needed to be focusing on. And I said, well, what about pandemics? And she said, and this is an ER doctor. We were in the ER talking about this. And she said, what do you mean? I said, we're not at all prepared for a pandemic. I remember her eyes getting big thinking, well, I hope that doesn't happen. Um, so I'll pass it back to you, and then we can transition to talking about 2020 and what it was like in the hospital. Yeah, that's the kind of thing that no one wants to be right about, for, for sure. Um, and thanks for that. You, I mean, I think you've really kind of told some really important, like, 
altering moments of of you know that you would revisit later on. I, I'm I'm curious. I'm I'm a big fan of sort of storytelling and um, sort of capturing the moment in a in a particular story. And I'm I'm curious for the three of you, sort of moving forward. So we're we're in the pandemic. Is there any particular moment that jumped out at you that you will never forget where you thought like either we've got this or wow this is not going at all according to plan um and maybe just you know to help you think I'll I'll share with you mine um there were two uh for me there were two moments where I just thought this is a total debacle one was seeing news footage of a completely empty Times Square, New York Times Square, having once lived and been an epidemiologist in New York City, never, ever being able to wrap my head around something like that. At that moment, I thought, wow, this is just extraordinary. The other one came not long after that, uh, when my kid's school announced that it was closing, and I got a text from a mom friend who complain you know complain she's like I don't know what we're gonna do they're gonna close the school for two weeks two weeks how are we gonna handle this how are we gonna get through two weeks and I remember replying to her it's not gonna be two weeks it's going to be longer and just thinking wow what it what's where does this all end how does this all end so um neither of those in, in neither of those scenarios had I envisioned the COVID vaccines um so I very i um, glad to have been wrong in terms of where my initial thinking of where this was all going to end. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll turn it over to you who anyone else has some some moments to share. Well, I just want to comment on, on Craig's comments because I think it's so important. I would have thought, I mean, and you, you go through the cycle of panic neglect and after West Africa, I mean, you know, I did a TED talk and I had a montage and it was the ISIS of infectious diseases you know, the disease of the decade, you know, and of course, you, you went to uh, professional things and it disappeared completely from the list of risks for the world. What surprised me the most, I think, is, is in a sense where we are with COVID now. So people don't want to talk about it. They don't want to think about it. They don't want to measure it. And in fact, we're back in that neglect phase of where we are with a disease that stopped the entire world to your to your story, Jen, about, you know, what happened. I mean, everybody in the world was influenced by this. But now you talk to political leaders, you talk to people and they're like, we'll never do this again. This, I mean, when somebody says to me, we will never require masks, we will never close a school. You know, my rejoinder is, well, what if you have a 40 percent mortality disease or a 70 percent mortality? Is it really never? And and so I think one of the challenges, and this is why the, the center is so powerful to me, is is in peacetime, how we're thinking about this and how, we, you know, we don't want to scare people to death. But we also don't want to Craig's point is is, you know, we're back to, oh, we're not going to do anything. We're not going to prepare. We're not going to set the systems up. Um, we're not going to learn. And, you know, if this is inevitable that we'll have more of these. So for me, that is such an important part of the, the lessons learned. And it speaks to Beth's earlier point about the problem with this, like, binary characterization of things. Like, you either shut it down completely or you don't care at all. And the reality is uh, that's not what happens, um, that we need to find a middle path for sure. Yeah, there's not enough nuanced conversation or, like, room to have conversation, even where reasonable people can disagree. And there was a lot of room for reasonable people to disagree about pandemic response, but we need to be able to have the conversation about what works in different communities in different settings without saying that it's not important. Because as Seth rightly said, we don't know what's coming next. We really, on it. one thing that I learned from this pandemic is we really don't know what's coming next. And we, we need to be prepared for that eventuality. Um, I'll just give maybe two examples. One is just more of a picture in my mind. Um, I was working at the Nuclear Threat Initiative during the pandemic, and I was running the biological programs. And so I was turned to for advice about pandemic preparedness and response. And I was doing a lot of, as many of us were, doing news interviews in March when everybody shut down. And I went from a news interview to we're shutting the office down for at least the rest of the week 
to never going back to that office as an employee. And two and a half years, maybe two and a half, two years later, I walked back into that office to a dead plant and a time capsule of just what the last, you know, year and a half to two years had been of my life where I left that office, you know, worked f- through the rest of the year and then transitioned into a White House role. But just going, you know, even walking back into the White House in an N95 mask on day one of the Biden administration without being able to see any of my counterparts throughout the administration transition, I think for me, anyone who looks at this pandemic and says, we're never going, you know, we, we're never going to take these measures again, or we're not going to get prepared. I, I just don't understand how we can get to that that place through the lived experiences that we have. And I think we have to find a way to tell these stories um, and be able to to um, to look back at what we got right and what we didn't get right with a reasonable eye so that we can we can move forward. Um, Craig, your story and kicking it back over to you. Um, is so in- incredibly poignant to me because you are a national hero who went, to, you know, to West Africa to treat patients, came back with Ebola, um, and then have gone on to try to train other people. I think it's it's I'm actually quite worried that we're not prepared for Ebola epidemics or for Ebola cases to come to the United States. It's a disease we see regularly. Um, it's de- we're definitely going to see cases again in the United States, and. I think we need to be prepared. Um, how are you thinking? How are you thinking about this? Um, concerned for so many reasons. You know, yes, if a case of Ebola showed up tomorrow in Providence or where, you know, wherever, yes, there may be other cases. I mean, the reality, though, is that with, you know, universal precautions and the fact that we have so many resources and supplies, like we figured this out pretty quickly and there sure would be a lot of panic And there'd be people that wouldn't show up for work and there would be chaos for a bit, but it would be nothing like the chaos that we saw in DR Congo with the second largest outbreak, the confusion and uncertainty, you know, recently in Uganda, especially with the fact that, you know, we have these wonderful countermeasures now, right? Vaccines and some monoclonal antibodies, but most of them aren't in the place where they're needed. Um, They're here. And so just like when I was in the hospital in 2014 and you know, there were providers in West Africa who were being denied medications for ethical reasons or because of lack of access. You know, I was being told that, you know, after it was clear that I was going to survive, that, you know, the FDA could probably find a dose of this medicine and get it driven down for me. Like, so much of my concern is not necessarily on our own preparedness here, of which I do have some, but on the inequities in terms of our preparedness and our willingness to stay prepared here, which still is not enough or adequate, but it's going to be so much better than, again, the resources and the mental resources that, you know, so much of the global community seems to be willing to put in place for a lot of the other countries and health, you know, systems that I've worked in over the past, you know, 10, 15 years. So I think that's my biggest concern. When I think about, you know, your initial prompt of, what was it that made me sit back and think, well, this is going to be a problem? Um, there were many, you know, my friends were living, I'd lived in China beforehand. I had friends living in Beijing that called uh, called me in January and they're like, I don't know what to do. Should we leave? Can we leave? Um, my wife was definitely the, the crazy lady at Trader Joe's in like end of January, early February with like two carts full of stuff, including toilet paper. She's like, you all have no idea what's, co- you know, what's coming. Um, so I feel like I was too much on the inside to know which in mid-March, as we were waiting for kind of this COVID deluge, you know, it was four years ago today that I tweeted, um, what I write, finally home after 13 hours in the ER. Today, 90% of my patients were confirmed or likely COVID. Many really sick, some in their 30s like me. The sirens on otherwise empty New York City streets are unending and haunting. I'm tired, but back in the ER in the morning. And that was like seven seconds of, you know, me just being like, this is it. Not realizing how this reality had not sunk in for other people. So for me, I had been aware, I'd been concerned, just like many of you for quite some time. But it wasn't until like seeing the response to that and to other things that I was sharing, interviews that I was like, oh, wow. Like I was, I had kind of gotten used to people getting really sick and starting dying, you know, in in the coming week, more people dying 
in my emergency room in Upper Manhattan than I'd ever seen in an Ebola treatment center in West Africa. But it happened in such a way that it almost, I, I guess I was less surprised. And when I shared that with everybody else and saw how surprised they were, that for me was the moment of like, oh, wow, I've, I need to snap out of it and recognize how big of a deal this is. Jen, can I jump in on that too? Quickly? Just say like with a huge dose of humility, myself looking at, at the moment that Craig is mentioning and me reading Craig's tweet, um, he struck a chord with me. What I was thinking at that moment, reading what Craig was writing about what was happening in New York was how can this be happening in the United States? And how are we unable to translate the incredible capacity that we do have in this country into a response that works in a federalist system. And what did I miss? And I, I mean, I think everybody missed a lot in this pandemic, but I was looking back introspectively, what did I miss in the senior roles that I've had in our ability to get that right? And specifically, I was at that moment also really worried about testing because we didn't even know where the disease was um, to be able to help the next set, the next wave that was going to happen to overwhelm people like like Craig. So I just wanted to to throw that in. I think there was a fair amount of denial about how the U.S. was going to be affected. I, I remember talking to some um, state health leaders before, you know, before the shutdowns, before everything about what are you doing to get ready and like getting people blinking, you know, at me, like thinking like, what, what do you mean? What are we doing to get ready? That's that's a thing over there. <laughs> You know, like th there were there was a period of time where people were looking at it like it's over there. It has what do you, you think it's coming here? But we, we're we're going to shut down travel. We're going to, you know. Uh, so I think there was a period of time where it didn't dawn on enough people that this was going to be something that would mark require that that every country was going to be affected by that. This wasn't something that you just stop a few planes and you're going to prevent it from going that it was probably already here but we weren't seeing it because we weren't yet testing we were only testing people who had traveled we were in no way doing the kind of testing that would allow us to figure out if it's even here yet it's spreading i, I was saying yeah, yeah. every time on the media you know we're only safe if we're all safe and i don't think people really believe that until delta wave hit yeah. and we saw the you know, burning funeral pyres in India. And within a month, that strain had moved around the world and was back. And, you know, so I think people began to get that idea. But going back to what Craig said, I mean, I want to go back to Ebola because I think it's really interesting. Um, you know, we do have a vaccine now. We have other interventions. They work. We've been able to control epidemics. But when he mentioned the Uganda epidemic, this was a, a real shock to me because, it turns out that wasn't Ebola Zaire, that was Ebola Sudan. So it was a different strain. And lo and behold, there are vaccines that had been prepared, but nobody had them in a vial ready to go. And so we came very close to having another West African situation because, you know, it turned out a patient had moved through um, uh, the capital city and moved from clinic to clinic underground. and potentially infected a lot of people. It could have been a disaster. Eventually, it was controlled by public health means, you know, 72 days after the outbreak started, but vaccines didn't get there until after that. And it just, that said to me, again, what, what was the cost? We're talking a couple of million dollars, maybe, to have vaccines in a vial. And every two years, if you don't use them, you got to re, you know, make them. But that's an example of not having the long term vision and preparation for a world. What is, you know, we we did we just lived through a 12 trillion dollar epidemic is two million dollars too much to spend for a potential agent that could spread. And so I think, you know, for me, that also is a real lesson. It isn't only COVID, which is so you know, in a way, it made people numb because it was so overwhelming and people don't want to think about it. But all of these other problems, we have to be prepared all the time because we don't know what's coming next. And for me, that kind of has to be the, you know, the, 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 the statement. And today, still, there are people in America who don't believe that vaccines are good, that don't want to be vaccinated. Not not a couple of people, but large numbers. And and I think this to me is a challenge because, you know, that anti-vaccine 
you know, kind of mindset spread around the world? And how does that prepare us for other potential outbreaks when we are lucky enough to have tools? We may not always have the tools. And, and if we don't have the tools, then we have to use these other interventions that we've already talked about. Can I just add one other thing onto what Please. I just said? Because the story about you know the uh, the Ebola Sudan um, vaccine candidate was interesting, not because the pharmaceutical company had put in vials and was ready to go, which was not the case, but because I believe it was John Cohen from Science Magazine who called them up and was like, "Hey, you, I think you talked about having these doses in the past," and they had to go look and find it in a freezer. And then, you know, then get it ready, then unroll it so that it could be used and maybe a vaccine trial. But by that time, good old public health had done its job. We got lucky, as Seth had pointed out. But look at the fact that right now you have how many cholera outbreaks around the world? And despite cholera being one of the first vaccines that was made over 100 years ago, we have almost no access to it. I was able to get a dose last year at a clinic in Providence when I was going to go to Sudan. Um, I you know, the likelihood that I'm going to get cholera is incredibly low. The fact that people right now who are getting cholera with, you know, destroying health systems, but can access it is to what Seth has pointed out and has worked on, which you've all worked on, is we need to do more to not just get COVID vaccines out for, you know, people in the U.S. that are willing to take them or, you know, get them out globally, which is important, but all these other things that remain health threats, we have we have seen their impact we should have learned but that panic like gut cycle is uh is at risk of repeating itself just yeah. a funny comment on the cholera issue um it turns out that you know um seven or eight years ago there were two million doses of cholera vaccines used worldwide and this last year we didn't have, we don't have enough we're, we're at 35 million soon to go to 80 million but what's interesting is when i was at gavi one day somebody came to me and said um, you know, uh, I had a request from, I think it was Ethiopia from the minister and said, you know, we have cholera. And I cheered. And my staff was like, How, why are you cheering? You know, you, this is a terrible piece of news. And I said, yeah, that is absolutely true. But up until now, it's been acute watery diarrhea because nobody wanted to admit cholera was a disease because it it, it brought stigma. And so, you know, who knows how many cases of cholera we actually had in the world. And again, it's part of this having the ethos of being able to talk about it, being able to share that information, and then use that to intervene. And if we knew, you know, that cholera was going to be in more demand, we could have pro probably scaled up the production of vaccines more. And of course, with climate change, we're going to need lots more of this going forward. I'm just going to pause for a second, just because um, I want to talk about one, the importance of preparedness. It sounds like you all think it's important. Just want to be very clear about that. Two, sort of, you know, not just COVIDizing our our worry list, et cetera. But I just want to um, uh, suggest to everyone who's listening who wants to ask questions, please utilize the Q and A box, and we'll try to to go through the questions. So just um, feel free to start typing away there. Um, but yes, preparedness is it important. And what do we need to do going forward? You're all already starting to um, go into the forward-looking portion of this, but Beth, go ahead. I was just going to say we need to be systematic. I think both um, Seth and Craig were hitting on this point, but we frequently will start down a path and then stop. And we can call it panic and neglect, and it definitely is panic and neglect, but it's also sort of a lack of a systematic vision. One of the things I really like about the 100-day mission is that it's systematic. The idea is for every you know, potential pandemic viral family, we'll have candidate vaccines in the freezer that we can then more quickly um, get to a safe and effective stage. So this is, and then the second part is we have to be able to scale and distribute globally so that we're, there's access around the world. And that's the pragmatic part is that it's important for high income countries to be paying attention to low income countries during pandemics. In fact, it's, it's critical. But it's also reality that countries will be looking inward during a pandemic. And so we need systems and facilities in place, tools that are 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 fit for purpose and can actually focus on access for the rest of the world. Um, I'll leave um, Seth to talk about the, the great work um, at Gavi and globally because he was right in the middle of all of it and put a ton of, of his own personal ingenuity and creativity on it. But I would say that we, we don't have what we need 
for not only vaccines, but I mentioned earlier, we don't we don't have a way of scaling tests or oxygen right now. And th those two things early on are critical. Personal protective equipment, we don't we still don't have a way. We have states around the United States who are sewing their own masks, and we still don't have access to PPE reliably. And we don't have sort of a systemized, systematized approach. Who's responsible for that? Where's the manufacturing going to come from? How can it be sustained in during the market in peacetime? These are the questions we now know to ask. We should ask them for each of the commodities that we're going to need and then work with innovative financing to get there. Um, the second thing I would just um, quickly say about preparedness is we do need countries to have lab capacity. We know that lab capacity is important. We know disease surveillance capacity is important. And we need all countries around the world to be live to worst case scenarios. So we need and the next generation of decision makers to be thinking at that very early stage when many of us around the world were looking and thinking, it's already here. Why are we still talking about COVID like it's an over there problem? It's obviously already hopped a flight to the United States. We need decision makers around the world to be thinking that way all the time. And so that means we need opportunities for people who are interested in national security, international security, public health, um, global health. We need those people to be thinking what could be happening and to be able to talk to decision makers. That's something we're focusing a lot of time and attention on at Brown is how do we integrate some of that training and provide um, students with operational experiences. If I, can, if I can jump in and I, I'll, I'll say something about vaccines since you set me up for that, but I wanna start with testing. And, you know, one of the frustrations is, you know, we now have a world in many places where people actually know how to self-test. I mean, this is, you know, a change that occurred. And, and what's interesting about that, we didn't really figure out how to get the data from that to help us, you know, uh, track the disease when people are positive at home, but nobody knows about it and it, it doesn't help us. But we also haven't advanced those tests. So what I want is a test that has influenza COVID, and let's say RSV on it. Here, you know, here. Easy, cheap to do, but why? Is, people say, why is that important? Well, if you have influenza, there are treatments available as well. And if you, if you test yourself against COVID and it's negative, you don't the next day test yourself again, the next day test yourself again if you're positive for RSV or, or, or for flu. So, you know, getting, beginning to take these tests and use them as consumer tests would help us be prepared in the future. So just to say a couple of things on, on vaccines that were very interesting, um, you know, uh, routine vaccine coverage globally went down during the pandemic, and that was a tragedy. People didn't get immunizations. And so people focused on that, and it's right to focus on that. But what was extraordinary was the delivery of, of vaccines by these small teams and the resilience of those health systems. So. If I look at, you know, the, the poorest countries in the world, you know, they've over time delivered more and more doses of vaccine. But, for example, um, in 2020, you know, they, they went from 900 million in 2015 to 972 million doses in 2020. In 2021, they delivered 3.1, um, you know, billion doses of vaccines. Same team, same people. And yes, routine immunization went down because they were being pulled over. But one of the challenges, we also have to talk about the, the, um, the heroism that occurred during this period. I mean, you know, we talked about what Craig did and the, and the health workers in the U.S., but around the world, we had teams that were able to respond. The question is, in peacetime, again, how do we prepare and say, OK, where's the list of all the doctors and nurses? Who has cell phones that we can get in touch with? How do we have needle-free delivery systems or other tools that people can use? And again, these are all part of a systematic preparation that, that, um, that, that you talked about, Beth, that is gonna be so important as we think about being prepared for whatever the next pandemic is going to bring. So I'm hearing systematic preparation that sort of pan threat, right? Because it's we don't know what the next um, pathogen is going to be. I'm the last emphasis... one was supposed to be flu. Yeah, if you right, remember, exactly. we were all prepared for flu and it was COVID. Yeah. 
because we have some some great examples of the technology being developed, but the systems to enable the technologies to reap their benefits very much need to be built and maintained. Um, we also have themes emerging from these conversations about sort of national preparedness. And I think we have some good examples of, you know, challenges and stumbles in, in epidemics. But boy, when you make a, glo a global situation like a pandemic and every country's in it for itself and every country is wanting the same things, there are efforts where countries are going to be, you know, they have to, they have to be ready. They have to be prepared. Obviously there's more work we need to do to be able to support that, enable it and, and to deal with the equities issues that, that invariably will come up. But uh, the, the challenge with pandemics is the kinetics of the response change. It's not like there's this geographically limited event happening and we could take resources from some part of the globe and bring it to another part of the globe. It's, it's everything is the same stuff is needed everywhere. Absolutely. What else did I miss, Craig? You know, thinking about this this toward the future prompt or, you know, what we need to be thinking about next. Um, I, I think of the strategic and the systematic planning. I think about what Beth has mentioned a few times, which is a unified response. I'm thinking about a unified response at even a more local level, like down at a community level, or even, um, you know, for example, during... COVID in 2020, I worked at one of the largest health systems in the country, which was right down the street from one of the other large health systems in the country, which was across town from one of the other largest health systems in the country. And our ability to communicate during that time was little, if none at all. Um, we were not sharing patients. Um, there were there were methods and attempts put in place to try to make that happen, but we were not a cohesive whole responding to a unified threat, something that was tackling and bringing down all of New York. We had multiple health systems trying to manage it in different ways. And part of that is the way healthcare is set up in this country in you know pandemic mm -hmm. peacetime. But we need to think better about how we convert those mechanisms at time of great need. And part of the problem, as you pointed out, Jen, was that you'd get to blank stares, like it's coming here, it's going to be that bad here. I remember even in mid-March trying to convince hospital leadership, like we're going to lose 30% of our staff starting in a week or two weeks. We are going to be 30% down. Like, what is our plan for that? Um, if you can't envision that part, you're not envisioning the fact of we're going to be so overloaded with patients and there's going to be another hospital across town that might not be overloaded. How do we share our patients, our providers, and our resources? At the same time, I remember in March 2020, reaching out to Ron Klain because of his role during uh, as a Bolazar being like, hey, what was the discussions back then about how we think about a federal licensing, you know, uh, the ability to share nurses and doctors across states, because everyone is required to have their own licensing and there's very little reciprocity. Like, what are the mechanisms for doing that? And he said, you know, we looked into it, we tried it, but there's not a really good way to do it. These are things that we need to figure out now, Absolutely. right? Like we need to, we need to, you know, and I know these discussions have happened in healthcare, these structures I've talked about, you know, what we'll do, but like what we saw um, as makeshift stand-in scenarios was, you know, instead of finding better ways to communicate and coordinate transfers of patients, we were bringing in ships um, with the USS Comfort, or we were building these facilities, you know, at the, uh, you know, the tennis center out in Queens, but because of the restrictions that were put in place, no one was actually using them. So we can learn from those lessons, but we need to take this time now to go back and say, these things didn't work. How are we gonna do better with this stuff next time? Because this is the stuff that's really gonna make a difference. In the first few days of a pandemic, if it's something new like COVID, I tell people this and they don't believe, they don't believe it, but our ability to save lives in the hospital was not and in the future may not be marginally better than it was in 1918, right? And so there are things that we need to think about how we reduce risk to providers, how we prevent the system from being overloaded. And that requires our infrastructure and our planners and people to think quite differently than we do the majority of the time. One of the things I'm really worried about, Jen, is that yeah. we will preserve the type of learning that Craig just outlined mm -hmm. here and around the world. But um, you know that, and we've done a webinar on our American Democracy and Health Security Initiative. We're going to be rolling it out um, this spring. 
And one of the things that we're finding is that there were a ton of innovations that happened at the state and local level, not surprisingly, but along the lines of the things Craig mentioned, how did hospitals share information about patient load so that they could more effectively work together? Um, organizations that came together around equitable access in different populations and building that into the response at the governor's office level. Um, innovations around modeling and testing that, that surfaced. And some of those were bespoke for the specific population and, and group and system or state, but a lot of them were similar or replicable, honestly. And there are, there is a lot of learning and sustainment that could happen, but we're at risk. We're losing so many people from burnout and also just natural change in, in careers and jobs that we're not going to capture some of this. Um, and so that's something that we are, we're really interested in doing. And I think just as a, as a call out to our listeners, um, we'd love to hear more about your experiences um, in the pandemic and things that you think are replicable and sustainable so that we can build them in, uh, build them into our efforts. And then the other thing that we're missing, Jen, that we spend a lot of time on here at the center is um, is something worse than COVID. So we are worried about the possibility of a, of a, of a, of a, pandemic flu or a, a disease that might be more transmissible or more virulent. We're also worried about deliberate and accidental risks um, and um, other um, ways in which the pandemic might be worse than what we saw in COVID-19. And to be able to prepare people for that, but also to get upstream and ideally prevent that by building biosafety and biosecurity capacity into our systems. Those are other neglected areas that I think we need to spend some more time on. And I completely want to, you know, foot stomp about the, the need to make sure we don't forget the lessons that we've learned. I, I remember actually just before the pandemic, having published a study where we had asked uh, health departments around the country, around the U.S., um, if there were to, going to be a pandemic, how ready would you be to rapidly vaccinate your population? And um, the, ans the answer was not ready. But um, part of what we were hearing was, you know, we think that this was done in the last pandemic in 2009. And so there there, there were plans then. And so we'd ask, well, you know, where are the, do you have those plans? Can you dust them off? And they're like, you know, the person who worked on that isn't here anymore. But we think the plan is somewhere. And that was really, I mean, I bet if we asked those same questions now, we would get a lot of those same answers. The person who worked on this then isn't here anymore. So we very much have to capture that. I do though want to like, raise something that's come up and it's in one of the the questions that's in the the q a box is about sort of like the public fatigue and like compliance with public health recommendations and what we do um going forward and seth you referenced you know people thinking well you know people saying never we're never going to do that again obviously we want to move away from these these binary things i will just say you know for me when i re mentioned seeing you know pictures of an empty new york times square i mean i don't think that approach is what we should in any way be aiming for, right? The idea of having to shut down society is not the goal. Um, the idea is to prepare such that we can be resilient in the face of these threats or prevent them from happening so that we don't have to upend our lives in a way. Um, but it's going to require work and it's going to require trying to figure out what are our broader menu of options besides just shutting down New York Times Square and shutting down our our kids' schools for a year plus. It's going to require investing in the tools and the systems um, to enable us to be able to respond. And Craig, to your point about healthcare, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about um, flattening the curve. And that concept was about trying to kind of not ultimately change the number of infections, unfortunately, but kind of spread them out over time so that we wouldn't overwhelm what was already a very vulnerable, not very um, resilient health system. And not a lot of effort to figure out how to lift the line, which is yeah. what we were trying to flatten the curve beneath. Um, yeah. And I worry going forward that, you know, we see every flu season health systems tipped into to crisis. Obviously, that's over a much shorter period of time. And um, flu is uh, so far in recent years, not been nearly as deadly as COVID-19 um, was before vaccines. And so, but we now have lots of respiratory viruses to contend with at once and the potential for new and worse scenarios to also occur. Yeah. 
Uh, I see another question popping up here um, about uh, um, HIV care networks. So COVID being not the only pandemic people are are living with and wondering how HIV care network affected, impacted COVID responses. Um, maybe a few things. One is just uh, your thoughts on kind of, and I think you've referenced this a bit, kind of talking about these systems that, you know, maybe were built for one thing, but um, put into place for something else and sort of what that value was, um, but also maybe reflecting on kind of a vision of preparedness that isn't just singularly focused on a particular pathogen and maybe, you know, more encompassing of the totality of health needs of a community. So anyone want to chime in on that? Maybe um, I can jump in on a, on a couple of points because I also don't want to be overly down on, we've talked about a lot of things that haven't worked. There are lessons learned and, and there are things that are happening. And I talked about the resilience of, of health systems. One of the things that we thought of, given the way Gavi worked, was it was a network of institutions. It isn't, you know, an institution. It's WHO and UNICEF and the World Bank and and the secretariat working together with civil society and others. And so what's been set up since has been funding to allow that network to keep talking, to keep sharing their lessons learned, to have you know, the pieces that had to be generated during the pandemic, to have those ready to go again. And I think that's an important investment that needs to occur. As Beth has made the point, not just in vaccines, which was ahead of the her, but in treatment and, um, you know, in, in diagnostics as well. So I think that's something we can do. Another thing that was done is we had lopsided manufacturing of vaccines around the world. There was enough vaccines in 2021 to vaccinate all the high risk people in the world. Of course, that's not what happened, but they were there. Would it help if we had more distributed manufacturing? So again, now there's an effort to try to move to the places, particularly Africa, where there is not a large scale manufacturing now to, to open up some new manufacturing facilities, an effort that'll take some time, but will be really important as we think about that. And then the other lesson I really liked um, was, you know, when we started and I was doing the fundraising for global vaccines, we had zero money for that at the beginning and we had to fundraise. And of course, you can fundraise, but even when you get a yes, it still takes time for the money to come into your bank accounts. So now there is a zero day facility to jumpstart and a, a number of innovative um, uh, institutions, Beth's been involved with working on some of these that are standing by so that you can take that money available immediately and use those innovative financing facilities to make enough money to get things jumpstarted. Now, those are just a few concrete examples of things that can really be done. A question on HIV, the HIV system was used for some um, system strengthening in developing countries and caregivers and others. And it is really an all hands on deck. The thing you have to keep in mind though is to make sure that we also continue to provide the services, for example, for HIV, because when you disrupt those services, you of course cause deaths from that um, even though you may be helping on the on the on the COVID side or whatever the pandemic is, so it's making sure there's enough capacity to do both um, at the same time going forward. I'm going to turn to a couple. We just have not too many minutes left, but I want to see if we can get through a few more of the questions that have come through. Um, one is about um, a willing ally might be if we're first thinking about like kind of the structures in our society willing ally might be the military who are focused on preparedness um maybe beth if you have any thoughts of that i will just say um i think that that's a common approach in preparedness um uh i think it there's some upsides and downsides to that when we think of sort of the societal reaction um and how things are conceived but beth any, anything you want to say quickly no, on that? I I'd say the same thing. I think that the the military and the Department of Defense more broadly, not just the military, but the whole structure of the Department of Defense does provide a lot of core capabilities that were really helpful during the COVID pandemic and and for health security capacity to include their ability to, to work quickly with contracts, their ability to scale, their ability to help people, their ability to work with the National Guard, 
all of these things that we needed. I think that having the Department of Defense lead on a response is challenging in a number of different communities um, because it can increase fear, it can increase stigma, and um, in some countries, it's just not possible because it really, um, it, you know, it really incites incites more more fear and concern in people than than help. But in our own country, the Department of Defense plays a major role, um, and in in support of the civilian um, the civilian enterprises, particularly the Department of Health and Human Services and the Federal Emergency Management Agency, that do so much. And we need that capacity to continue. Um, there's two other questions here. I'm just going to read them, and then if anybody wants to quickly react to either of them, um, one is what about adding COVID nineteen component to seasonal flu vaccine, and the other one is. Um, about uh, work to address uh, public fear and stigma. So on the on the uh, adding COVID to seasonal flu, there are a number of manufacturers that are now working on having those two vaccines. What we really need, though, is another revolution. We need vaccines that protect against all strains of COVID and that protect against all strains of flu. And those are theoretically possible. And so we need a really you know, more aggressive research effort using the best science that exists today to try to be able to do that. Just add something, I don't I don't know about the vaccines, but in terms of fear and stigma and thinking about what lessons we take from this and maybe some of the main points from some of the questions that are there. You know, the one thing that I really want to hammer home is that this event is marking four years of you know this being a pandemic and four years of this completely changing our lives as you know Beth had mentioned you know leaving an office and going back into it a couple of years later my wife you know left her office um, got pregnant had a kid um, and like never saw the kid you know she never saw any of her colleagues when she was pregnant like so much has happened in this last four years and it becomes so easy for us to compress that time frame it becomes so easy for us to overlook the fact that we haven't processed this, I think appropriately as a nation or as a global community. It becomes so easy for us to forget the fact that over a million people have died. And I know we hear that number so much. 100,000 was an incalculable loss. 1.2 million people is massive. For the first time in almost a century, an infectious disease was the number, was in the top three killers in the United States. And then it happened for years in a row, despite the fact that we had an unbelievable and unprecedented push to get people vaccinated. Um, as I said, I saw more people die per day in March and April 2020 in one of the best hospitals in the world than I saw in tents in West Africa. Our healthcare system was hobbling on the brink. Like, I don't think people truly recall like what that meant. We were talking about running out of ventilators and we were incredibly close. So I encourage everyone to think about this moment, what this four years means for you. And then try to take a second to reflect on what it was like hearing those sirens if you were in New York or DC or somewhere else, hear those sirens in the background all day, every single day, and try to sit in the discomfort of remembering what the uncertainty and the chaos felt like. And then try to bring that together with the fact that the prevailing narrative right now is that the people who led this through the last four years, who shepherded through this, were wrong on nearly everything and shouldn't be making many of these decisions in the future. If you look at legislation that is limiting public health activity and decision-making across the country, if you look at the current response to measles in Florida, there are so many more warning signs in addition to the ones that we all talked about in 2019 that are blinking now, but I think the biggest one is our own apathy and our own inability to sit back and reflect on how bad it was four years ago, the culture in which we made many of these decisions, some of which ultimately turned out being wrong, but because of the work that folks like you did, far fewer people died than would have. And we're lucky enough to be here to have this conversation today. So I think, thank you, Craig, for that. I think that's actually a really poignant uh, note to end on. Um, we are unfortunately out of time. This has been really fascinating. My opening conversation, uh, I could talk to you three all day and I'm very grateful that I get the opportunity to do that regularly. Um, I just wanna really thank you for the, taking time to share this uh, these thoughts publicly. Um, thanks to everyone who attended today. Very much appreciate um, your participation and um, great questions. Uh, I'd also like to thank my team at the Pandemic Center who helped put this event together, Bentley Holt, Leah Lovgren, Carly Gaska, Andrea Ulig, and Aquil Person. 
Uh, if you'd like to share this event with anyone who is unable to attend, the recording will be posted on the events page of our website uh, uh, probably sometime next week. And you can find all uh, recordings of our previous webinars there. Please follow us on our social media accounts to learn about our um, uh, uh, upcoming events and webinars and um, reach out to the email address on the screen with any questions or suggestions for future webinars in the Pandemics and Society series. Thanks so much. Take care.